John. Uh, excellent. So um, we're going to get started. Uh, I have a few uh, introductory words. We were just trying to agree what, what order we should sit in. I thought sartorially we should go from smartest down to, to least smart, but Torsten has... Uh, <laughs> Torsten's messed it up. So um, anyhow, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the LSE for this evening's uh, event, which forms part of the LSE Festival. How do we get to a post-COVID world? Uh, the festival is taking place from today, Monday the 13th of June to Saturday, events all week, uh, for those of you who feel like uh, multiple activities. And it's part of a whole year of activities at LSE, exploring the practical steps we could be taking to shape a better world. So I'm Henry Overman. I'm the research director at the Center for Economic Performance and director of the What Works uh, Center for Local Economic Growth. I'm going to be chairing this evening. I'm very pleased uh, to welcome Torsten. Sorry for the uh, uh, comment on your dress uh, dress code. Uh, who is a chair of the Resolution Foundation? Caroline Fairburn, former director of the CBI, and Steve Machin, director of the CEP. Uh, and we're here to discuss the latest findings of the Economy 2030 inquiry. Now, there's always a risk at this moment. I've, I've got the introductory notes for each of you. So uh, let's see how much of it I get right. So Torsten is the Chief Executive of the Resolution Foundation. Background in economic policy. Current research focuses include inequality, the labour market, tax benefits, housing and wealth. Uh, prior to leading the Resolution Foundation, Torsten was Director of Policy for the Labour Party. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, he, none of that will. And he has worked as a, a completely unbiased civil servant. Uh, so, Carolyn, let me try. I've done quite well so far. Joined the Confederation of British Industry as Director General in November 2015 and held the role until 2020. Previously worked at the World Bank, The Economist, McKinsey, and in government as a member of John Major's Number 10 Policy Unit. She's one of the Economy 2030 Inquiry Commissioners. That fact I knew I had right. Uh, Steve is Professor of Economics at the LSE, Director of the Centre for Economic Performance, Fellow of the British Academy, President of the European Association of Labour Economists and a Fellow of the Society of Labour Economists. All good. OK, so all of the panel tonight uh, are involved in the Economy 2030 Inquiry. The Inquiry is a joint initiative between the CEP, Centre for Economic Performance, and the Resolution Foundation, and it's funded uh, kindly by the Nuffield Foundation. So the Inquiry is looking at the challenges the economy faces in the next decade. Uh, we're now at our halfway point. Uh, some of us are feeling slightly fraught as our interim report is due to be published uh, next month and is in the process of being drafted, well, hopefully as we speak. Uh, today, we'll be exploring what we've learned about how shops such as Brexit and COVID have affected people and businesses, how we can prepare for upcoming challenges, such as that transition to net zero. Uh, so we're looking for ways to address the UK's weaknesses and harness its strengths. And I'm sure our panelists tonight will uh, hopefully have uh, plenty to say about uh, both aspects. Uh, for those of you who are Twitter users in the audience, the hashtag for today's event is LSE, hashtag LSE Festival. For those of you who are here in person, I'd ask you please to put your phones on silent. Those of you who are at home, I don't really mind what you do, although I'd love to you for, be, uh, for you to be paying attention to us. Uh, the event is being recorded and hopefully it'll be available as a podcast, subject to nothing going horribly wrong uh, while we try to record it. So um, let me just explain how it's going to work and then let's get going. We're going to start with a pre-recorded message from Manu Shafiq, who is the Director of the London School of Economics and uh, the co-chair of the economy 2030 then we'll go through uh, each of the panelists in the in the audience that they're here um after that we'll have a, a short debate on stage and then i'll allow plenty of time for questions from the audience uh, as well as questions online so there we go uh let's uh, go to the uh, video for minish to the LSE Festival and to this evening's talk, The Decisive Decade, How Should the UK Navigate the Economic Change of the 2020s? My name is Minou Shafiq, Director of the LSE, and I hope to see many of you in person at events later this week. The theme of this year's festival is how do we get to a post-COVID world? The pandemic posed many challenges to our health, our economy and our society. And while this was hardly the first global pandemic, these challenges were unprecedented in the way they threatened our truly integrated and interconnected global society. And in many ways, though certainly not all, we rose to meet them. There have been incredible tales of human ingenuity, 
compassion and determination. From the rapid creation of safe, effective vaccines to the incredible volunteers raising funds for NHS workers. And we at the LSE were proud to play our part, providing timely, rigorous and practical research evidence, including assessing the impact of COVID on care homes, suggesting how best to support children's education and improving global access to vaccines. But this is not the end. And not only because the pandemic still rages in many parts of the world without our resources. We in this country still have many lessons to learn and preparations to make. Because COVID will not be the final threat. Tonight's talk is about the multitude of challenges we face in our overall national socioeconomic situation. Many of which existed long before we entered the pandemic and will persist long after it. The biggest of these is climate change, and as a global community, we must make radical changes in this decade to avoid catastrophic effects, or should I say, further catastrophic effects. In the UK, there are also the specific challenges of Brexit and long-standing low productivity growth. And of course, we will certainly be unable to avoid longer-term structural problems associated with an aging population rapid technological change, and geopolitical tensions in Europe and beyond. The ways in which we confront these challenges, or not, will determine if the United Kingdom will remain one of the strongest, fairest and most prosperous countries on Earth, a topic that is certainly worth thinking ahead about. These are weighty subjects, but ones which our speakers tonight are more than qualified to take on. I thank them in advance for coming here this evening to share insights from their research and personal experiences, and perhaps leave us all with some reasons to be hopeful. This kind of research and public engagement is the driving mission of the Economy 2030 Inquiry, a collaboration between researchers at the LSE Center for Economic Performance and the Resolution Foundation, which you'll hear more about tonight. It has had a busy first year, by the end of May, the inquiry had produced 20 reports and hosted 24 events, all dealing with the overarching questions facing the British economy in the next generation. The inquiry is funded by the Nuffield Foundation, and I'm delighted to be a co-chair of the commission leading it. In its interim and forthcoming final reports, the inquiry is setting up a clear-eyed and evidence-based map of where the British economy stands today and how to navigate the path ahead, because we want to both know how to get to the post-COVID world I spoke about earlier, and we want to make sure that when we finally reach that destination, it's where we truly want to be. This is just one of the many events that the LSE Festival is holding, both online and in person, to explore the practical steps we can take to shape a better world. We have wonderful speakers, such as our own Professor Leah Yippy authors Elif Shafak and Dr. Fiona Hill, as well as Saturday workshops for children, or as we like to say, researchers of the future. Make sure you visit the Research Showcase exhibition and don't miss the chance to ask questions and learn more about the projects on display at one of our Meet the Researchers receptions. I hope you enjoyed tonight's event and all the programming of this year's LSE Festival. Well, uh, Torsten, Manisha's given us the challenge. Yeah, that was a rather, it's rather intimidating. Not least when she said, oh, what's coming later in the week at the festival? Well, those are great events. You guys may have made a terrible mistake. <laughs> uh, some of those are great. And I've almost forgiven you for your disgraceful comments earlier. Some of us make a lot of effort in the mornings, Henry. Uh, and it'd be good if you showed some respect for that. Now, um, we're going to bring up some slides. I promise not to go on for too long. The, um, I'm going to pause. Wait a second. We're not kicking off yet, people. Uh, I'm going to hopefully leave you with one big question at the end which maybe we can get into discussing which is is the job for britain in the 2020s these new challenges what the pandemic has left us with what brexit is doing to our economy has it changes it and um how we deliver a net zero transition or is it how those things interact with our existing big problems which i'm going to come on to which we knew we had before the pandemic and it looks like we will have as we go through after it now 
most of this is about the exam question is not academic. This is an exam question about what should policymakers actually do? What should be their plausible approach to returning the UK to stronger economic growth and a fairer society in the years ahead? OK, so it's about action. It's about it's not about having perfect information about, you know, spending another two years finding the answer, which is why the research timetable is quite stressful. The, uh, I think Manoush said 20 papers. I think we're actually up to 25 since you recorded that, and there's another 10 coming out in the next kind of 10 minutes. The, so there's a lot going on. Right. The first thing is obviously to say we're not having this conversation in a vacuum. So this is a chart just showing you inflation. Okay. Now, you don't need a chart to tell you that inflation's gone through the roof. One, you've seen the news, but two, you go out shopping. And you will have anyone that's filled up a car, not very common in London, but I promise you that's how most of the country is getting around, knows that it is a really hard deal. I was in Washington recently for, a, uh, and one of the dinners I was having there was with people from the administration and people outside the administration. The ones outside the administration are less keen on the ones inside right now. And one of the poor guys from the treasury over there said, halfway through the dinner after he'd had been screamed at for most of the dinner said, um, look, why is everyone, I don't understand, like there's really fast earnings growth, really high employment. Why does everybody hate the president? At which point everyone started screaming and all pointing to how much it costs to fill up a car. And I promise you, in the States, it's still cheaper than it is here to flip a car. So this is the immediate priority. It's obviously bad for everybody having inflation at levels we've not seen for four decades, but it's a disaster for poorer households. They don't have the savings to fall back on. Remember, three quarters of families on benefits have no savings at all. It's not they have 100 quid to fall back on for that bill when something breaks. They have no savings at all. So this kind of pressure on people's budgets is bad for everyone, but it's particularly bad for those on low income. So that's the first thing for the government to do, deal with. But obviously the bulk of what we're focusing on in this programme is about the longer term answers for the uh, UK economy. We're taking as a given the Bank of England will do its job and that we won't end up with entrenched uh, inflation. If we do, we've got a whole other set of problems to deal with. So, so what then is the task, ho hopefully after we have dealt with the very difficult year we have uh, ahead of us? The, um, so I'm going to try to keep this simple, which is to say, look, what is the nature of 21st century Britain? It's a country that is living with the high inequality given to us by the 1980s. OK, this is a chart of one measure of inequality, but most charts of inequality, however you choose to measure it, look something like this. We're wandering along post-war at a, you know, a, a level of, this is the Gini coefficient, around 25%. It then shoots up from 27 to 37% uh, over the course of the 1980s. And yes, we can argue about the shapes and the bouncing around since, but the big picture is it's been high ever since. Higher than almost every other country in Europe, Bulgaria and some others managed to stay ahead of us, uh, but lower than the United States. And that high inequality, which it's the public concern about actually wasn't very high in the 1980s, okay, for reasons I'm going to come on to, but concern about it has started to rise since. And one year of high inequality for a society is, does not feel the same as decades of high inequality. The experience of it, the way it entrenches between generations, the way it changes the dynamic of your democracy is very different from one year to having lots and lots of years of it. And the, the, when, the time when concern about inequality did start to rise in the United Kingdom, wasn't when inequality went up in the 1980s, it's when growth stopped at the financial crisis, which is what this next chart is talking us about. So the, we're living with the inequality of the 1980s and the economic stagnation of the 2010s. So productivity growth has more or less ground to a halt since the global financial crisis here in the UK. And that sounds like abstract. Lots of people like to say, oh, growth doesn't matter for families anymore. It doesn't matter for real workers. That is all complete garbage, okay? The lack of growth, the lack of productivity growth is why wages in Britain went into the pandemic the same level they were when we went into the financial crisis. OK, this is showing you income growth rather than wages, half the level in the 2010s of any other decade since the Second World War. And that was only because employment went through the roof. OK, wages, no growth at all. If you were on benefits going backwards, particularly for large families during this period. So we're living with the 80s inequality and we're living with the stagnation of the 2010s. Those two things tell you most of what you need to know about why Britain's political economy is so difficult today. But the 2020s obviously isn't just about living with history. It's about what happens next. And, and uh, Manoush touched on that earlier. We're spending a lot of time trying to think how these new changes that are coming. And these are just the ones we know about. OK, we didn't think that COVID was going to be one. But COVID... Brexit and the net zero transition. These are all huge things, okay? You know, I was in the treasury, as you politely reminded everyone, when we were buying banks there. I always love introductions that start with, they were in the treasury when there was a global financial crisis and they've lost a lot of general elections. It's always, <laughs> it's always what you want. So uh, uh, you've got to, we, we, we then thought this is the once in a generation crisis, okay? We thought the history books will be about the 2008, 2010, and then we'll get back to some normal-ish calm times. 
not so much. Six years later, you foolishly agree to run the CBI, then we Brexit. Uh, and then a few years later, we go into what we would say is a once in a generation crisis, except we just had one a few years before. And now we've got a European war for the first time in decades. Okay, so this is not normal times. It's not stable times. It's not easy times for people. It's not easy time for policymakers. The other thing that people, there's a slightly techie chart. I thought, people say, okay, look, all that change is coming, okay? But we're used to change. Change is always speeding up. The robots took all our jobs. Everyone's always changing jobs these days. So we can, you know, we shouldn't be surprised about this new areas of change turning up. Okay, that is rubbish. Change has been slowing down. It's not just that young people don't drink as much anymore, have sex anymore, go out very much anymore, move around the country anymore. Young people move jobs less now than they used to. And this chart is showing you the long-term history of structural economic change. So it's a chart of how much um, the economy has changed in terms of people moving from one sector of the economy to another sector of the economy, okay? And what it's showing you is that we are, just focus on the light, uh, the green, or I don't know what that is, green slash blue line at the bottom oh, there the bottom. <laughs> for a second. We are the, have the lowest level of structural change in the last decade on record since the 1930s, okay? All right, we are doing less change. And that's partly because deindustrialization is done. So you see the peak there in the 1980s, that is deindustrialization, right? The, um, since then, it's not true that we've kept on changing more than ever. Okay, and that's really important as we go into a phase where more change might be ahead of us. Because if we always just think change is speeding up, right, then we, then we don't have to then wrestle with what happens when it actually does. The, um, so that's the backdrop. 1980s inequality, 2010 stagnation, change in the 2020s. And the question is, what is the politician, how do politicians engage with that? And the first thing I think is, we need to be honest with ourselves that for Britain, relative decline is a risk. We're a really rich country, depending on how you want to measure it, somewhere between fifth and ninth. There, that's not really interesting which one of those you think is the case. But we're a rich country. We have lots of great resources, like our university sector with LSE, language, geographical location, lots of things. But we are going backwards in terms of our relative prosperity. All countries have had a slowdown since the financial crisis. We are the winners for the biggest slowdown. All countries have had an income squeeze. We have the biggest squeeze on our wages, that's before we get to the pandemic. So I think, you know, I sometimes worry with policymakers, they're like, oh, look, another bad thing's happened, okay? The problem is not that just another incremental bad thing's happened. The problem is that Britain is settling into relative decline, and that is not what any of us should be aiming for in the 21st century. So more constructively, what do we do about that? And this is just giving you some of the flavors of the arguments that we're gonna be making in the coming interim report for the, this is totally not exhaustive. These are some of our answers. The reason we're doing this report and this work is because our view is that the answers being presented or discussed in politics today are, to be honest, they're unserious. They're not honest about the nature of the challenge facing the country. They're not honest about what the potential routes to growth are for the UK. And they're not honest about how big the change will have to be in some areas to make any difference. All right. And so that is some of what I'm going to then come on to talk through uh, now. Right. So into some charts. OK, on the left is the average of OECD countries in terms of goods exports, goods imports, uh, and service imports and exports. The lines are going up, that is globalization. We're not going up anymore, but we were globalizing before. Okay, the, on the right is the UK, okay? The only thing I want you to notice here is that the UK does not look like the rest of the OECD. So focus down at the bottom there on service exports. The UK is a service superpower, okay? It's the defining feature of our economy, even though no politician wants to admit it. When I talk to politicians, I often feel like they think that Britain is basically just does banking and they wish it did manufacturing, all right? Okay, but banking's been in decline for 10 years, it's just no one seems to have noticed, okay? We export all services. We have a very broad basis, not just the university sector. We have a very broad basis of comparative advantages in services. If we are going to be a rich country, we are going to be a rich service economy. There is not some route to suddenly changing these big structural reasons why our economy looks like that. If you look at over time at countries, the things they are good at do not change year to year. They change over 50 years. Yeah. The, um, there's also a really big reason why we're not going to suddenly, by the way, this chart on the right looks like the UK does more goods exporting than service exporting. That's because you import a load of parts for goods that you then export. If I did this as value added, the service sector would be significantly higher. Okay. And you can see the direction of uh, you can see the direction of travel. We, we are the second biggest service exporter in the world, okay? Now, I'm not even saying that's good or bad, okay? I'm going to come on to some of the trails in a second. I'm just saying that is what we are going to be doing, all right? And if we don't state the truth about that, we then don't make 
the right decisions both to make a success of it, but we also don't deal with the downsides of it. So some of the work we've been doing with Henry and the rest shows countries that have service exports, okay, even looking within our country or between countries, are more unequal, and they're more unequal in two ways. Earnings gaps between people in rich tradable sector, service sectors are larger, right? And exporters for services tend to be more concentrated in big cities. Manufacturing can be done right across the country, in general, within reason. Uh, cheap land helps manufacturers. It does not help service exporters. They are happening in our big cities, and so you get bigger gaps between places, and that can be hard for your democracy. And so, if you are once you don't, if you don't accept that you're a service economy, you don't accept that you need to deal with those downsides, right? And you don't do something about them. Okay, so be honest about the kind of country we're in if you want to do any of this. Services, though, doesn't have to mean just about the southeast. This is actually a chart from a paper Henry's authoring uh, at the moment, so he can tell me when I get it wrong. But the, um, it's showing you the, the, uh, a measure of productivity per job in this case, output per job, across different local authorities in the UK in the top and France at the bottom. And the size is to do with how many people live there. I think you kind of knew London was big. It's big and it's rich. I think you knew that. The, um, there's two things you should take from this chart. The first is uh, we are low productivity. Okay, look, look at the lump of look at the lump of places towards the left, and they just all moves about ten thousand pounds to the left compared to the same country places in France. Now remember, everyone thinks France and us are very different. French and UK GDP has basically moved in line with each other for like a hundred years. Like we and the French love to pretend that we've got nothing in common. It's literally like the country we move most closely in line with. The, um, but we are behind on productivity at the moment significantly so almost all of that gap is because the British private sector does not invest okay our public sector investment which is all politicians talk about is fine right now highest level since the 1970s the private sector does not invest Brexit has made it worse the pandemic has made it worse okay and if we don't recognize that that's the investment we need we don't start moving those lumps to the right hand side the second thing to take from this chart is look service exports will happen in cities but they don't have to just happen in London Okay, we have a second city, you can't, it's not named here, but Edinburgh is sitting in the middle of there. Why is that richer? Because it's the other place that exports some decent, uh, decent services. But Manchester, Leeds, even Bristol that everyone says is booming these days, way down to the left. Those cities are where we could, we could do better as a service economy. And then that would make, it would close our regional output gaps. It wouldn't solve everything. It would probably increase inequality in those regions, right? But that is a price worth paying for a richer country and for closing the gaps between the country as a whole. Now, if you got that to happen, say you did get Leeds to be firing on all cylinders, Manchester, Birmingham, or at least some of these cities, that would bring other downsides. Actually, one of the big winners would be poor people in London, because who loses from London being really successful? It's harder to be poorer in a really rich place because your housing costs go up with output right? But your wages don't in the same way, okay? They, um, so in these places, if we got them to be really successful, we got that private investment to happen, we should then worry about the downsides, which is what the next chart is showing you, housing costs. So the poorest households, housing costs as a share of income at the top, the richest households at the bottom, okay? This chart is, should be horrifying for you, okay? The lowest income households used to spend in 1980, 15% of their income on housing, right? They're now spending 40% on average, on average. So lots of people are higher than that, okay? The increase is, particularly recently, is all about the bottom, okay? The richer households are only spending 10%, all right? And have been coming down basically since the early 1990s. Housing has got cheaper for the rich in Britain, which not anyone says, since the early 1990s, because interest rates are basically free money for people with existing large uh, mortgages. And if you're going to have success in these other cities, you need to make sure that the poor in those cities don't have to face suddenly rising housing costs. So you need, you need to anticipate the problem as well as making the success happen. And that means social housing, more housing in our big cities, right? Whenever I go to Manchester, everyone says, oh, Manchester's booming, right? It's nonsense. What's the poorest part of Greater Manchester? The centre of Manchester. It's the centre. It's poor. It's poorer than all the outskirts, despite what everybody says about Greater Manchester, Manchester being really rich and everyone else getting left behind. It's nonsense. The rich bits are the outskirts like Trafford, uh, Stockport, commuter suburbs for the centre, all right? It's really important to not deal with the world as you think it is, but as it actually is. The, um, right, now, Manoush mentioned the pandemic and us hopefully learning some of the lessons. And one of the lessons is, who, who in the room stood on the doorstep and clapped some, you're looking quite international, so maybe not everyone did. Anyone stand on some doorsteps? Some of you? 
what did learners get out of us clapping? Not a lot, not a lot, all right? The, um, so this chart is just showing you one of the things that we should then worry about. I think Steve's gonna come back to this later on the labor market. But so the left-hand side is showing you people who are low paid and the right-hand side is showing you everybody else. And it's showing you the, how proportion of those people that are suffering from forms of labor market insecurity, be it hours variation, zero hours contracts, temporary contracts. Now, I'm not saying these things are always bad. There's good reasons to use temporary contracts sometimes. There's good reasons, reasons to use zero hours contracts sometimes. There's less good reasons for not telling people their shifts two weeks in advance, which is what happens for many people in the UK today. But security of work has been going up actually for, for higher earners over lots of the last three decades. Job satisfaction, despite all these books about bullshit jobs, that book is bullshit by the way, okay? People's job satisfaction hasn't come down at all. All right. I'll tell you whose job satisfaction has come down, just low earners, who used to be the most satisfied in our country, and are now, despite the minimum wage increasing their wages faster than anyone else, the least satisfied. No, they're equally satisfied, but they're the only ones that have seen a loss in their job satisfaction. Their stress has gone up, their work intensity has gone up. All right. Doing something about that is what an economic strategy that takes seriously that high inequality problem starts to deal with. It means changing how we regulate the labour market. It means doing more than just increasing the minimum wage. Uh, we're going to have to get serious about net zero. This is a chart of us not getting serious. This is a number of insulation activities that have happened in Britain over the course of the last 10 years. Okay, we, This is a country with the worst housing stock in Europe in terms of its energy efficiency. Okay, And the reason this matters is because the task in delivering net zero this decade isn't the stuff everybody wants to talk about, about changing how companies work. It's just sorting out our homes. This is the, the electric car stuff is easy. All right. This is the hard bit. Our homes are a disaster. We can't put heat pumps in them. Anyone got a heat pump in the room? No one? No one? Well, okay. You all need to get heat pumps in your room by some, by over the next 15 years. You can't even put them in most of our homes because the energy efficiency, okay, is too bad right now. We have to retrofit huge swathes of our country. This is what we did. Cut by 90% how much of that was happening back in 2012. Now we've had an energy crisis. We're starting to think that might not have been a good idea, but we've now got to go, our curve growth rate for this now needs to go absolutely through the roof because otherwise we can't then start putting the heat pumps in the 2030s, okay, and having a system that's ready to roll to deliver net zero in the 2020s. But poor households can't do that because it costs their entire annual disposable income to change their house, to put an energy insulation into the average home is the entire income of a low income homeowner, okay? That is what the state is gonna have to deal with in this decade. The, uh, look, if we want more change to happen, we also have to give higher earners some more insurance. This is a slightly complicated chart. So let's just focus on the blue dots for a second. Lowest income people at the lowest income households at the top, middle income in the middle, highest incomes at the bottom. It's telling you, the blue dots are telling you what percentage of your income would you get to keep if you lost your job? Because the benefit system would kick in and give you some, all right? The first thing to say is it's pretty low for everybody compared to the, most of the world, okay? Of the advanced world. You don't get much income insurance if you lose your job, but it's lower for high earners, because basically we have an unusual system compared to most of Europe, that the amount of income support you get is not tied to how much you were earning before. And when we've been doing focus groups as part of this inquiry, low earners are not actually particularly worried about losing their job. Now, there was a tight labor market when that was happening, so we should caveat that, but they'd think, well, I'll just get another job. Their problem is that the jobs aren't good enough, right? Higher earners are really nervous about economic change because they know they can't pay their mortgage. Remember the benefit system in the UK doesn't pay your mortgage if you lose your job right? They know they can only last two months if they lose their job and their pay will probably fall because higher earners' uh, job is more, their pay is more closely associated with the skill matching they have with the firm they work for. So if you want to, people to change more, which we probably do, and we're going to have to because of the changes we're talking about, we need to offer decent insurance to people to cope with it. The, um, the poor might, lower earners don't need more insurance particularly, although that would be nice. They just need higher incomes, okay? The poorest 20% in the UK is 20% poorer than the bottom in France. 20%, not 2%. They are 20% poorer. Okay. That is, you know, it's all, it is almost un unbelievable. These are countries with very similar GDPs because that's what happens if you combine weak growth and stagnation with high inequality. Okay. This chart is showing you what we've done to basic benefit rates since the Second World War. The basic state pension, the basic rate of unemployment benefit were basically the same until the 70s. And then since then, we have systematically said, we don't really care about the basic level of support. It's gone up in line with prices, while everything else, like the pension, went up with wages or faster. As a result, it's basically not grown at all in real terms 
since the 70s, since the 90s, sorry, since we're back to the level we were in the early 1990s, and the economy is a bit richer since then. Anyone that was in London, that's where I was growing up at that point, in the early 1990s knows London was not a rich place at that point, even though everyone thinks it was now. The, um, but we're, that is the decision we've made. That is why people are poor. It costs money, but you have to do something about that if you don't want to have people destitute in food banks, which is what's happening in Britain uh, today. So just to wrap up, we should do something about this, right? The point of this is not it's all grim. The point is, You've got to be realistic about what your country is. You've then got to target your successes. We do need growth. I've absolutely zero time for the degrowth uh, argument, although we need sustainable uh, growth. But we need inequality down if we're to be a sustainable country, because that's not just about economics. Okay, we might believe that lower inequality means higher growth. It may or may not, depending on whose research you believe. Uh, but it will make you a better society, and it will make you democratically sustainable. Okay, because we do not want to end up where the US is today. So here's the concluding thought to wrestle with why this matters so much, because countries don't automatically get them out of themselves out of these messes. So this is showing you on the left hand side, the UK and Italy's GDP per capita relative to Germany. So the first thing is, folks on the left, pre financial crisis, we in Italy were a bit poorer than Germany. All right, not much, a bit poorer. Since then, we've both gone backwards. In fact, Italy hasn't grown at all. Italy is what relative decline looks like. Okay. Right. We've both gone backwards. We've fallen back by about, uh, I think our productivity has fallen about 8% relative to um, Germany. The Italians have gone even further backwards. The Euro crisis was significantly worse for them. All right. If we spend until 2030 behaving like we have over the last decade, we will be more similar in income to Italy than we will to Germany. All right. These are big differences. We will be a lot poorer as a country. And I told you, the poor are significantly poorer than the poor in Germany already so it's their incomes that will be you know you might think oh i can do without the bankers well maybe we can they, um, but you can't do with the poor have income not getting some decent growth so it's not a game it's basically the point of economic policy here and admitting where the risk to us of relative decline even while we recognize the strengths is the start of putting it right so i shall wrap up there and on to henry or to carolyn or hey, carolyn. thank you very right. much Dawson. <laughs> Are you, are you going to cheer us up or depress us further? I'm definitely going to cheer you up. Okay. Going to, that's, that's it, is always, it is always such a pleasure to follow Torsten. He doesn't always cheer you up. And this is supposed to be a festival. Sorry, after sorry. All, okay, all right. There's a party on. Uh, there's a party on. But um, two reasons why it's always fantastic to follow you. Uh, the first is you do give us the facts. And some of them, I think you'll agree, are really surprising. But what they are is the unvarnished truth. And... Um, I mean, it's very interesting, isn't it? You know, if you look at today, it almost feels as though we're at peak politics again. You know, what's the national conversation about? It's about breaking international law, the Irish protocol, and it's about who might succeed Boris Johnson as prime minister. What we need is peak economics. Uh, and that's what the LSE does. It's what the Resolution Foundation does, and Torsten is what you do. So that's the first reason uh, it's fantastic to follow you. We have the unvarnished truth. Um, but the second reason is you always pose the most interesting questions. Uh, and you started off with, um, I think, a really fascinating one, which is to what extent are the challenges facing us now kind of new? Are they? created by COVID, created by Ukraine, created by climate change, uh, created by uh, Brexit. And I'd like to be um, actually pretty firm on what I think the answer is to that. And I think that they are really, really not new. Actually, what we need to do to get us to a post-COVID world are exactly the same as they were pre-COVID. Uh, and um, I'd like to give a few thoughts on what um, I think those things might be. And, and, and I guess what they come from is, um, uh, Torsten and Henry both mentioned, I, I joined the CBI at an interesting time. Uh, you know, timing is everything. I, I said yes to that job and signed on the dotted line uh, two months before the Brexit referendum was announced. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people thought I was mad. Uh, and um, with hindsight, it was a, a very interesting time. But what I did during those five years was to spend most of my time talking to businesses out in the country uh, from, from John O'Groats to Land's End, um, many of the parts of the country that uh, Torsten showed were the small dots uh, on the map, uh, many in London as well, but I talked to businesses of all shapes and sizes. And the thing I came away concluding from all of that is that the answers to a lot of the problems we have are really, really not rocket science. We actually know a lot of them. 
And I just wanted to rattle through a few of them and please, please challenge me uh, on now I'm out of the CBI, I can be a little bit more uh, uh, forthright than perhaps I was. Um, and so I will rattle through some of them. Um, the first is if you talk to businesses across the country, um, actually, I'm gonna say something which you really might disagree with me. I think innovation is overrated. Innovation really matters, but only a few people have to really do it. What really matters is the take up of technology and adoption across the country. And what I found in my travels across the country is we have an incredibly uneven take up of even some of the most basic technologies um, around customer database management, around internet usage, um, around even email, um, around some of the real basics. And if we really want to get out of our productivity malaise, and I mean, Torsten, it's not even since the crash, we have had kind of 40 years of productivity stagnation. Um, you know, what is so interesting is that we had this boom period in the first half of the last century, which was driven by the combustion jet engine, the flushing toilet, the washing machine, um, and that drove extraordinarily high productivity growth rates of you know, four or five percent higher. And we've been stuck in 2%, and now we're down at nothing. Um, to get out of that, if we could light the touch paper of take up of new technologies, and not even you know, blockchain, you know, it, it, is, it, it would make an enormous difference. And I think there are some very easy things we could do there. We could name the top five technologies and help businesses take them up. This could be a government program if they weren't busy talking about other things. We could fund match investment in technology with the skills investment you need to go alongside it. So that's one, innovation overrated, tech adoption totally underrated. The second thing is we have to fix our education system. We really, really have to fix it. We've been talking about it for years. Tony Blair made it, you know, education, education, education. But if you go to Blackpool, if you go to many parts of the country, our primary education system, our secondary, uh, secondary schools are just not good enough. And I have got you know, a few ideas here, but one of them is I would abolish GCSEs. I would abolish them and I would replace GCSEs. I mean, very few countries in the world, very few of our peers would educate, uh, would have two sets of exams for 16 and 18 year olds. The knock on effects of having such an exam heavy uh, uh, timetable for our children is that teachers burn out. They don't want to go into the profession. You can't get them to, uh, uh, understandably, to add new things to the curriculum. And what we need is to teach children about life skills, about communication, about confidence, about, um, about mental health, about running a bank account, about owning a home. Um, and we don't teach those things at all. Get rid of GCSEs, fill up the, the curriculum with a lot of other things, uh, better things. And I think you would see an absolute transformation. Um, I would also... Uh, uh, take our Teach First programme, which has been absolutely fantastic. In London, it turned schools around in five years. People think education takes a very long time to turn around. London showed it can be turned around within a matter of two or three years. Take it across the country. And the final thing I think there is lifelong learning. Make it lifelong. Now, the government has some plans around this. But when I talked to businesses across the country, they pointed out to me some of the really um, seasoned uh, leaders of our businesses, that in 30 years, there had been 29 changes in government policy around skills and training. How do you invest behind that if you're a business? So, uh, and then the third thing is connectivity. You have to connect places. And um, uh, one of my very first visits when I was at, uh, at the CBI was up to Middlesbrough, which is a very challenged part of the country. Um, the steelworks there had just gone uh, bust. Um, and my overriding uh, memory was how incredibly hard it was to get there. Um, I was almost late this evening because the, my train was cancelled. Um, we don't have uh, full fibre broadband across our country. And in terms of international connectivity, I'm not going to go on about Brexit. I did that for a long time and I've stopped. Um, but we have gone backwards in international connectivity. Governments must invest in, in connection. And um, you know, Crossrail, hurrah, is opening now, but it's two and a half years late. The Heathrow third runaway probably will not happen now. That is a disaster in terms of trade and in terms of connectivity, get it right. Um, so three things, tech, skills, connectivity. I've got two foundation points that I want to end with though, that I think are absolutely fundamental and Torsten uh, inevitably has touched on, on, on both of them. The first is we really, really need a plan. 
we need an economic plan. The countries we're competing against have them. Japan has an economic plan. Canada has an economic plan. France has an economic plan. We don't do them. And I have never felt that we have been further from an economic plan than right now, which is why I go back to saying, you know, the kind of work that Resolution Foundation is doing, the kind of work that happens here at the LSE, let's call for one. Because businesses, going back to my experience with firms across the country, if policy changes all the time and you don't know where you're going, you don't get investment. Why is private sector investment low in this country? Because we don't plan. So um, I think that is absolutely fundamental. It's time for one. And my final point is really one I'm so pleased that Torsten ended up with this. Inequality is actually of enormous concern to businesses across the country. They really care about it. And I mean, interestingly, when the, when the minimum wage was first introduced, the, the CBI backed it. Um, uh, I constantly, in my time at the CBI, uh, backed, um, ba backed a rising minimum wage. Um, I backed rising productivity because that leads to higher wages, and Torsten and I work together very closely. Um, but you need insurance. You need social insurance for people to take risks, for people to change jobs. And I think this really profound point that the, uh, that the Commission has unearthed, that we have become more resistant to change and less good at it, and not better at it, which I think many of us would assume, I think is really profound. And I think one of the reasons for that is people are not prepared to take risks. And I think if you look at where the change is going to come from, the AI revolution, where the job losses are going to come from, they're going to be spread right across the income spectrum. And we want everybody to be prepared to take that kind of risk, to retrain, to move on, to, to become something different. So social insurance, for fairness reasons, for productivity reasons, for business reasons, and because it's the right thing to do, I think is absolutely uh, profound. So a few, I hope, even if they don't completely cheer us up, um, some directions for what I think could be the way out of this. Thank you. Thank you. I have to say, Carolyn, as the, as the, as the parent of a child sitting 25 GCSEs at this precise moment. I, I, I'm, I'm a rapid convert on your uh, suggestion that maybe we should abolish GCSEs. Steve, taking this up or down? Mood-wise. Mood-wise. You'll have to see. <laughs> okay. Have okay. Um, so I thought I'd, I'd spend my five minutes um, uh, talking a little, little bit about the research activities uh, that we're, we're, we're undertaking and uh, at the Economy 2030 uh, inquiry, and in particular give some reasons why we're doing it and try to offer some insights about where we think it's taking us to. Um, so the research structure that we've got uh, is organised under these quite broad themes about people, uh, places and firms, uh, with various uh, cross-cutting themes uh, to do with shocks, uh, and those shocks would be, uh, the main ones would be Brexit, COVID, uh, and uh, dealing with net zero. And, and so, so we think this is it's pretty important to uh, build up an evidence base uh, that's relevant to explain about why, why the economy has got to this situation it's currently in, uh, and, ha and how that's been quite a long-standing uh, uh, process. Uh, over the last few decades. Um, and in particular, to, to think about uh, how economic uh, change can be managed better than it has been, uh, because there's been big problems in the way that economic change has been managed in the past. Uh, and I would think this has not been stressed so much in the academic work, but actually those, those distinct policy changes that have made, been made at various times have actually been uh, led us to be partly in, the, uh, uh, in, in some of the holes that we're currently in. Um, and so I think one of our big objectives is to try and take on that very ambitious agenda to try and think about how we can do things better than we've done in the past uh, and not carry on down some routes that have been very bad and very, uh, and, and, and very divisive uh, for, for people, uh, places and firms and, ha and, have, that, and how, they've, uh, how, they're, how they've kind of um, uh, operated uh, under big constraints uh, in the recent past. So we'd like to think about, um, if you want to think about this as an economic model, um, about how we can have a better economic model than we've, than we've had 
uh, in, in the recent past. Of course, some of these uh, bad aspects have been true in other countries as well, uh, but we've got our own special, uh, special aspects of being bad, I think, uh, that we may, we may want to concentrate on um, as, as we're sort of going. So the context of that is an economy that's been um, characterized by these rising inequalities that both speakers have spoken about before, uh, and uh, over the last four decades at least, um, uh, we're at much higher levels of inequality now than we were um, 40 years ago. Um, and also more recently by the stagnation of wages and living standards for, of onset uh, and very markedly and more markedly than in other places and an extremely poor um, productivity growth performance. Uh, so as, as Carolyn said, pre-2007, pre, 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 2007, pre the global financial crisis, uh, productivity growth was doing all right. It was about 2.4% a year uh, from, from, from around 1980 to, to 2007. It's actually, since then, it's been 0.2% uh, of a percent uh, per year, so essentially zero. It's essentially just completely stagnated, stagnated uh, and flatlined uh, for a long time, which has led us to be falling behind, uh, falling behind most of our competitors. Uh, but even worse than that, actually not growing in absolute terms. It's not like we're growing at 6% and Germany's growing at 7%. We're growing at 0%. Uh, and uh, and that's, having, that's, that's been having very big uh, consequences for uh, people, places, and firms. Uh, at the same time, running alongside that, and partly, partly the reason, part of the reason for that, of course, has been we've, we've experienced very, very low investment levels, uh, not only in physical capital, uh, also in human capital. Uh, uh, as well, and I'll come toward. I'll, I'll talk about skills a bit more um, in, in due course um, as well. We've had austerity cuts, which is a, one of our special features that we had uh, during the 2010s, uh, that have contributed to more stagnation occurring, uh, a poorer earnings growth uh, in real earnings growth uh, in, in, for, for, for people in the UK labour market, and a very very weak aggregate growth for the overall economy. Um, so I guess I'd like to just, uh, I'm a labor economist in terms of most of my research that I do, not all of it, but most of it. And so I'd like to just speak about this a little bit through the lens of a labor market uh, and, 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 and try, try to sort of pull out a few of the more pertinent uh, aspects uh, about, about, about what's been going on. Um, so, so Torsten noted that mobility or, or reduced mobility has become a big issue, which runs against many people's priors about us having a dynamic economy. We don't have a dynamic economy at all. How you can have a dynamic economy when average productivity growth is 0.2% a year, uh, then that just seems like that's a you know, pipe dream. Um, <clears throat> what's also worth stressing actually, I think, is that the patterns of inequality change have been very uneven and, ra and rather different. Uh, Torsten liked, 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 chose to highlight the 1980s. Uh, inequality also has been going up uh, in various parts of the distribution all the way through from 1980 to 2020. In fact, if you split the, if you, if you look at labor market earnings and split the distribution into the upper half and the lower half, actually upper tail inequality has been rising all the way through. Uh, so the person who's, you know, the, the, the lingo we would use uh, is, is we would look at the ratio of the 90th percentile of the earnings distribution to the 50th. So the 50th percentile is some, the person who's paid exactly halfway. The 90th is somebody who's 10% from the top. That's been rising all the way through. Uh, it's carried on rising uh, e e until relatively recently. There's been a little bit of a blip down uh, when real wage growth has actually been terrible for practically everybody, something I'll come to in a second. Um, the lower half has actually um, uh, experienced very different patterns. There was a big increase in, uh, in lower half, uh, or lower tail inequality between 1980 and uh, 1999. And 99 is a particularly relevant year uh, to, to emphasize, uh, which is when the uh, national minimum wage was introduced. Uh, actually, and that's been increased very, very rapidly uh, over time, such that now that lower tail inequality, if, if, you look, if you look at the level of lower tail inequality in 2019 uh, compared to 1980, it's exactly the same. For hourly earnings, it's exactly the same. So actually, it's fully reversed. The minimum wage introduction is actually fully reversed. Uh, the inequality increase that occurred between 1980 and 1999, so such that we're back to the 1980 levels. So I, I, I think it's quite important to, to look at that because some things actually do work. Some things are good for inequality and the minimum wage, how it was implemented in, in, in Britain uh, with the low pay commission being set up and uh, actually an actual proper uh, dialogue between the social partners uh, within that, 
uh, the CBI and the TUC, and then having proper research underpinning uh, evaluating it as, as it's been continually ramped up over time has actually been a big, a big success. And so, so things can be done um, in, 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 terms of, uh, in, in terms of offsetting inequality. Policy can be designed to offset inequality. Uh, it doesn't have to be done the way that the uh, economic model has been done over the last uh, uh, 40 years. Okay. Um, another, another example I would give of, uh, of, of that has been um, uh, the way in which uh, policy has been thought of and forecasting uh, by various uh, uh, government agencies has been undertaken. The idea that, oh, things are bad now, but they're going to be pretty good tomorrow because we've got the model right and it's going to carry on. Uh, if you actually look at the earnings forecasts and the growth forecasts uh, made by the uh, OBR and the Bank of England and various other forecasting agencies they, in the 2010s, they've been absolutely terrible. Ex ante, they were continually predicting that earnings growth was going to come back next year, uh, most year as you go through. And actually it didn't, and it still hasn't, uh, which is quite interesting in, in the current cost of living crisis about earnings are clearly not growing anywhere near as fast as prices. And so real wages are falling again. Uh, and, and so the forecasting, uh, they're very much, and I think that's to do with the nature of the short-termist, the short-termist nature of the models that actually underpin those forecasts uh, and the way in which policy is implemented on, on, the, on the basis of that. So that's another example where we think we can perhaps do a little bit, a little bit better uh, if we can think about ways in which one can, one can do that. Uh, having different objectives, basically, from what, 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 what policymakers have had before. Um, um, so... I will, sh I will shut up in a sec. Um, so one of the big features about the Economy 2030 inquiry research is that we also have these cross-cutting themes associated with the shocks. Uh, and so that comes back to a question that Torsten uh, raised at the start about, you know, is it just about them now or is it about them in, in interaction with the, with, the, uh, with the situation that was in place uh, before, before these shocks came along? So the global financial crisis, COVID, Brexit, uh, net zero uh, targets and so on. Um, and so, I mean, I mean obviously, uh, it's not just about those, but they can possibly magnify the problems. And I think they are magnifying some of the problems that we've, we've, we've experienced uh, from the previous e from the economic model that's, that's actually been adopted anyway. So let, let me give you one example, uh, which was looking pretty good uh, to start with. If, if you look at the employment rate, uh, the employment population ratio, uh, in, in, in the labour market. Uh, we were actually at pretty much record levels uh, just before, before the pandemic. Uh, there's reasons why, and it, it probably isn't quite as healthy as it might have looked. There was a big rise in solar self-employment that occurred following the global financial crisis. There's been a quite a sizable rise in the incidence of insecure work, zero-hour contracts, uh, various other forms of work like that. So actually, whilst many people are in work, which is great, uh, the employment rate being at record levels may not be quite as healthy as it, as it, as it might have looked. I mean, maybe more slack in the labour market than actually that, that suggests. But that's a little bit bye-bye. So, so with the onset, with the onset of, uh, of the pandemic, we obviously introduced a furlough scheme, which actually seemed to work pretty well um, to start with. But actually, if you look at the data now about, the, about what happened, and, and jobs were very much protected by the furlough scheme. But if you actually look at it, and I think this, come, this comes to the planning uh, aspect that uh, I think Carolyn mentioned, um, if you actually look at where the employment rates are now, and now actually at the end of 2020, 2022, 2021, um, uh, Q4 uh, in cross-country data, uh, many countries have actually, bound, their employment rates have actually bounced back above uh, the pre-pandemic levels. Uh, we're still below, along with the US, we're lowest in the G7 uh, of that, despite a very good start with the furlough scheme. Yet the issue with the furlough scheme seems to be that it was really quite um, untargeted and pretty passive in its operation. Yes, it did keep, keep people in their jobs, uh, but there was nothing uh, in terms of contact, no help to retrain like happened in Germany in particular, uh, no obligations on firms to really do anything. And so actually we've now had this increase in inactivity of people who have decided to leave the labor market and just actually not even go onto, on, on, onto the unemployment register. Um, oh, that's, that's very old term, term language, but um, uh, yeah, <laughs> universal credit. Um, um, but actually just be out of it, uh, in, in, uh, totally inactive. Mo mo mostly be over 55s, but not only, there's some young people as well, but mostly over 55s who've completely dropped out. And so we've actually got uh, a situation where we haven't bounced back like the, like the other countries. And now we're again lagging behind 
behind on that. Um, okay, uh, let, me, let, me, let me just finish uh, with a couple more observations. So looking forward to quite important here. And so thinking about what an economic model uh, that could be uh, thinking more about well, important issues like delivering, uh, delivering growth, but inclusive growth, uh, but doesn't also increase inequality, inequality at the same time. Uh, seems to be important because the economic model for designing economic and social policy more recently has not been working, hasn't been working for a long time. Uh, there are some good things, uh, but there's many, many aspects that uh, have not been good. And so we've sort of got, a, and this is sort of contributed to the situation we're, we're, we're currently in. You know, we're, we're in some degree of trouble. Uh, we're in more trouble than we probably needed to be uh, if, if, we, if, if we'd have realised uh, uh, what was going wrong. Uh, but we need to get out of it uh, in some way, particularly out of the productivity sluggishness hole uh, that we're in. Uh, so I would also choose to emphasize issues that Carolyn did a moment ago, particularly on skills uh, and on uh, and actually on, on vocational education, where we've been very bad um, historically. Uh, and, and actually in the last uh, decade or so, I've got even worse. Uh, further education has been massively underfunded. Uh, since with the austerity cuts, I mean, hugely so. Uh, lifelong learning, you can mention lifelong learning, but it's hardly any of it. So it's hardly possible for adults to get any lifelong learning uh, right now. And that needs to be shaped up. And it's just one example, one example among, among several uh, that we need to do something about, I think. Uh, so, uh, so, so, so I will finish. And I hope that uh, it's, an ambitious, it's an ambitious task we've set ourselves uh, to try and do this work on economy 2030, but it's important, I think, uh, and uh, if we can make some improvements in trying to uh, think about, uh, about, about how economic and social policies can be designed with an evidence base that backs that up uh, and proper objectives to deliver kind of inclusive growth uh, and improve productivity, that seems like an important task. Uh, but we're very interested to hear what everybody's got to say uh, in the room about that. All right, so I've done the pooling job of keeping us time there, but I, I hope everyone agrees it was interesting. So um, we've got a mic. Uh, I can ask these people questions anytime. So uh, let's jump straight to Q and A's from the people that are here. There's a person there in the pink top, if you'd like to say your name and uh, where you're from. Uh, uh, hi, I'm Felicity Birch. I am, in fact, Carolyn's former director of innovation. Um, and you had me worried for a minute. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, and it was really great to hear you talk about um, uh, the importance of technology adoption. But the other thing we talked about uh, was the importance of adopting uh, processes and practices that have already been done elsewhere that work. Um, and I was reflecting that actually the last couple of years with COVID, we had a really profound period of policy innovation. Um, and I wondered if any of the panelists had uh, had any views about the policy innovations that you'd like to keep, uh, either in the UK um, or examples that you've seen overseas that you think we should really be adopting. Okay, let's let's round up a couple. Uh, there's a question at the front here, and then one over there. Uh, I'm going to let the steward pick which of you. So smile nicely. Yeah, uh, Bernard Casey from Frankfurt and mine, but also in London sometimes and today. Um, I wanted to pick up uh, Caroline Fairburn's point about the plan. Um, many, many years ago, I remember reading about something called dirigism in France. Um, and everybody thought that France was going to do terribly well, but I'm not quite sure whether France did any better as a result of dirigism. I'm not sure about the other plans that were mentioned, because if you look at the plan in Japan, I'm not quite sure whether Japan's performance would um, encourage us to do anything. I've never heard of a plan in Canada and in Germany, where I live most of my time, I don't notice yeah, many good. plans. So I'm a bit concerned about the plan. I'm a bit concerned about planned economies of any sort. And I wonder whether you could comment more upon that. Thank you. Great, thank you. And then let's just take uh, one over here and then we'll come over here in a sec once we go to the next round and then I don't know. So one more, great if you can keep it reasonably brief, fight amongst yourselves. 
uh, hi, Stepan is my name. Uh, just to say to our chairman, maybe my mind is a downer. Uh, <laughs> that's what they ask everyone. So uh, there was a little mention of global situation. Uh, like uh, I see the world now, or maybe some people see the world as there are three big factories, factory Asia, factory Europe, and factory America. And, you know, and we feel that most of the domination of American 20th century came from just its size of being the biggest economy. So if we talk about all these things we could do to give growth to, to, to British economy, how about, where is it standing in this global supply chains? Like if there are three pillars and it's kind of this, in a process of disconnecting from, from one it was connected to, do all other reforms or changes or implement stuff we implement uh, kind of not help because we didn't do the big thing? Great. Okay. So three, three questions. Uh, policy innovation that we'd keep. Uh, do we really need a plan? And where's the global in all of this? Uh, Carolyn, maybe kick us off. Like, do we I, really need a plan or, or any of the others? But. I'll, I'll start off with the do we need, because it's a really good question. I mean, you know, we, we do not want God's plan. You know, we do not want it. It, it doesn't work. It's, it's not the answer. Um, I think what I'm talking about actually is a framework around mostly the three, the three big drivers I talked about. So the areas where you need stability, you need policy stability and a sense of direction. And lots of them you don't, because I do actually believe passionately in free markets and the ability of firms working uh, together and individually to, to create wealth and, and people to create wealth. But in the areas of skills and education, I think you will not find a successful country in the world in terms of its education system that has not had some quite serious planning. And I think Germany absolutely is a case uh, in, in point there, particularly on vocational training. It's been stable and we have not managed, you might disagree. Um, secondly, on infrastructure and connectivity, you know, the private sector can, uh, can uh, provide the, mo the motor, sorry, provide the motor for, 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 for building, but it can't actually do a crossrail. It can't do, uh, it can't do a lot of these. It can't create the framework for full fiber broadband on its own. Um, and the final one I think is tech adoption where I think that there is a huge opportunity. So I, for me, plan, a plan would be about those, those cross-cutting pillars where government has a big role to play. Torsten, do you want to come in on um, any of those three? Yeah, I'll come, I'll, I'll maybe want to deal with a really hard one over here on the global situation. But all I would say, sir, is like thinking about criticizing the idea of plans from a position of the right, all I would say is Margaret Thatcher had a plan, right? She had a very clear plan, right? What she didn't have is track, what you mean is tractor targets, okay? It's not the Soviet Union. No one wants tractor target, or maybe someone does want tractor targets. I'm definitely not advocating tractor targets, but Margaret Thatcher had a plan. All right. And in the end, this is about does a country have a plausible story about how it's going to be economically successful in the era ahead of it? OK, and if you don't have that plausible story, you will not be able to coordinate any activity. You will be you will be at sea when bad stuff happens. And that is what is going on. So you know, it's, we're not refighting some war about the Soviet Union. No one's interested in that. The question is, do you have any idea what you're trying to do as a country now? Global role in the world. I think this is, I would, we are, we're thinking this through. I don't have the answer to this question because this is the question that Britain is big picture, one of the harder ones we face. So I think your description of the world is broadly right. That is how we should think about the big choices. Britain's current answer to your question, okay, is we'd like a bit of all of it, right? Yeah, no, no, but let's go through, but it's worth thinking about, it, it, there's a reason, there's a, there's, there's a non-idiot version of we'd like a bit of all of it. I don't think we'd want to want to do it, but there is a non-idiot version, okay? So the non-idiot version is a kind of unfair caricature of what small countries can sometimes do, which is free ride, okay? So we're moving into a world of more geopolitical tension, yeah, spilling over from some security issues into actual trade block style positions okay that's where we're like heading how does britain navigate that well one option is free riding all right which is these people are going to be in tension all i need to do is keep stum okay and soak up enough i uh, should be nice to everybody and that is but the, the, uh, it's not my position but there's a plausible view that you can try that that is what saying nicely quietly to china could you not do these human rights abuses but really ignoring it is about okay and it's what and it's what attempting to sit as a bridge between the us and the eu is about now the the problem with that is that we don't want to do it mm, 
I mean, that may be what's happening with Berry. Let's, but let's, let's go, let's make a conversation. But the problem is we don't actually want to do that. Okay, one, because we don't want to accept second tier status as you're calling it, like we're not, we don't see ourselves as Sweden, right? There, although we'd like to be as rich as Sweden right now, or Norway, definitely. Um, there, secondly, we want to talk, we, we don't want to pretend we don't care about China. And as the tension builds between those blocks, particularly relative to China, we will be forced into a choice, right? So I think the danger we've got is we believe one option is open to us, a bit of free riding. It is probably not going to be open to us, not for economic reasons, but because basically the US is gonna force the world into a choice. And then we don't have an answer in that world because you know, we would like a trade deal with the US, that's not gonna happen anytime soon. This large home market exists for us. So all I, what I would say is it's a long game. In the end, we will choose Europe. Uh, but you may be dead. So, great. <laughs> so, Steve, I'll give you one, one policy innovation you'd keep. And also, actually, from uh, from Evelina online, what, so you mentioned minimum wage as an example of a successful policy, but what would you do about the self-employed? As I know you have views on that. Well, I mean, okay, there's two things there. Um, so, which which policy which policies would you keep? Well, I think I think there's lots of them, but I, mean, I I would go back to the vocational education thing. I think we need to keep it, but also get, get it up and running in a much much better way. Uh, and I guess for I guess for language of, of the word plan is, is is a bit of an issue. But I but you know it's sort of you know I mean it, we need to have plans to do things better than we've been doing them. <laughs> And if that's a plan, then I think perhaps using the way we don't want 1970s industrial policy again, you know, we don't, you know, if, if you want to think about as planning, uh, but you know, but but so maybe, maybe it's a language thing, but you know, I mean, that's fine. On the self-employed, well, we know the incentives are, uh, between the self-employed and the employed are currently, uh, we know tax incentives are currently misaligned for one thing. Um, but the real, the real issue with the self-employed is that it, it seems to be actually that the solo self, the big rise in solo self-employment is that it is actually not for everybody because there's some people who definitely want the extra flexibility of being able to work in that kind of way as well but many of the transitions that we've seen in the big rise the million extra uh, people in 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 solo self-employment that, that occurred since 2008 up since the global financial crisis many of them are transiting in from unemployment uh, and and so it seems to be the only opportunities that people can have. That's why I was talking about more, but actually be much more slack in the labour market than the conventional unemployment rate uh, poss possibly measures. And so I think improving opportunities there is actually an important thing. Great. Let's do another three in the room. So there was uh, a person here in a bluish top. Sorry. So the further back De you are, the harder it is. To... Definitely straight blue. <laughs> Thank you. Thank see. you all. My name is Carrie Soppel. I'm a founder of a human rights education charity called Journey to Justice. Our most recent project is about economic injustice in the UK, and particularly looking at education. And since it's hard, I think, to disagree with the class being such an embedded issue in this country. And if we're talking about change and thinking one of our explainers in the film is Professor Sam Friedman from here, talking about his work on the class ceiling. Um, so I know this is never going to happen in this country, but I'm interested in whether you think if we got rid of private schools, it would make any difference to everything we're talking about tonight, or is it a red herring? Great, thank you. That's a good. Uh, that's a good challenge. So we young uh, are the young. Yes, go on. Yeah, let's, let's go to this. We're trying to take a diverse range of questions here. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Killam Varia. Um, I'm 13 years old. Um, I go to a secondary school where uh, teaching is a big problem. Uh, teachers normally quit at the end of the year because, well, us young idiots want to uh, drive them out their jobs. So, uh, and we annoy them a lot. So- um, You personally or everybody? <laughs> uh, I think I speak for the general- okay, uh, young people. Okay. I mean, I mean, I mean you, should, you should stop that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, how do you think, as the education system is, well, we think old, boring, repetitive, uh, how do you think we keep teachers in these jobs and uh, help make new jobs for, teach, uh, for teachers as well? Excellent, I like that one a lot. Great one. So we've got one over here. Uh, 
get both. We get both those two then, and that's, uh, keep it quick, and we'll, we'll do it. Uh, right Nicholas right. for Gerber Trust. Can I men mention connectivity? This seems to be one of the critical factors that we don't do much about in the UK. What if we made our towns and cities more like continental towns, made them more compact? What if we put investment not into retail uh, and boxes, but getting more people living close to centres? And couldn't that create a, a different feeling about the future in a, in a very tangible way? Great, and then there was one just behind there. Yes. Hi, uh, Pancho Molongeni. I'm a writer for the Namibian newspaper in Namibia. One question I had is what is the government actually doing to align economic policy with health? If we think about the monkey pox outbreak, if I were today as a queer person, I have any symptoms of monkey pox, I have no protection uh, for taking sick leave. I have no incentive actually to take sick leave because that's either me losing a day of my livelihood or going uh, keeping away from others. So did we actually learn anything from COVID? Right. All right. So let's uh, let's try and wrap through those four, and then there's the reception afterwards, where people will hear will will have uh, time to do uh, to, to add extra things. Um, so, private schools and secondary schools. I feel Steve. I should come to you. Yeah, I, I, I can have the education ones if you like. Um. So so I so I so I must confess I have a jointly written book called Social Mobility and Its Enemies. Uh, where we talk about uh, private schooling as one of the um, highly relevant issues uh, for amongst that. Um, should you get rid of them? That's been a debate that's been going on for a long, 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 long time, and I'm not sure it's a particularly feasible debate. There are other things that are actually potentially on the agenda about uh, uh, issues to do with the charitable status of private schools and about whether we should be uh, paying taxes on their profits, uh, which would, of course, would force them to put, uh, put prices up uh, presumably uh and and so that's that's the sort of interesting question i think if you if you actually want to think about potentially feasible policy policy kinds of questions um but the real issue really has to be i think about 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 improving the uh, uh quality of the um, state education that competes that competes with that uh i mean some people are always going to send their kids to private school no matter Whatever it was a big intergenerational thing. It's one of if if you actually look at intergenerational correlation of many measures of economic and social status, uh, the probability that you uh, the, the probability that you go to private school if you're if you're one of, one of your parents did is actually one of the highest uh, correlations you'll see. Uh, and so you're not going to really break that generational link, I don't think, by I mean uh, banning private schools. And if you did, you would probably just make some state schools much more elitist. Uh, and and so it's, and, and then the, that will be the the the, the uh, kind of domain that would be operated on. Uh, well, of course, one measure uh, is to improve uh, improve the um, desirability of the uh, teaching profession uh, in, 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 in some kind of way in state schools. Uh, one obvious thing is, I mean, I mean, you know, public sector pay has not been uh, uh, rising uh, very much in the last 10 years, and teachers have been uh, obviously one of the key occupations within that. Uh, it seems like it, that would be uh, one means to try and attract uh, attract people in. Teach First, which is what Carolyn mentioned, is a pretty good program for getting graduates into uh, in, in, into teaching, it's sort of based on Teach America to start with. But it's, it's become its own its own thing as well. So, so you're right. I mean, it's an it's it's an it's an important question. We know teaching the quality of teaching is one of the biggest inputs into the education production function. Uh, and of course, if you, education if you, production function, I didn't. See that coming. <laughs> it's inputs and outputs. Oh, right, thanks, thanks. That's how life. That's, <laughs> it's how, that's very romantic of you. It's the education production <laughs> function. And so, of course, and if, we, if we improve people's skills, which is what we need to when they're leaving school, that, of course, is something that we would hope would boost productivity as well. So I think there are important, it's an important question, of course. Right. We've got a couple more. Uh, there was uh, one on economic policy and health. Can I just pick up on the yeah, sure. on the teacher question? My, it's such a great question. Uh, my mother was a teacher at a comprehensive school all her life, so I grew up watching her, uh, listening to her. And one of the things that happened over the time she was a teacher is that more and more bureaucracy just started surrounding her. So she started, you know, being measured on everything, um, trusted less. 
Um, the curriculum was very prescriptive by the time she left about 15 years ago. I think it's probably become even more so. So one of the things I would do is make teaching more fun, you know, just free it up. So make it possible to, to teach stuff that you guys would really love to learn so that you wouldn't cause so much trouble. <laughs> but I, I think we have overmeasured. We are overmeasuring uh, teachers. I think we're probably overmeasuring and overbureaucratizing our medical professionals as well. Um, so that would be that would be my solution. Make it fun again, so it can be fun again. Well, look, I, I have to say, any, any anyone that homeschooled a GCSE student is uh, not fun. It's not fun. I have That's no, I I, I have no idea why half the stuff is on the syllabus. So, uh, Torsten, you've got health. The other one I'll add for you uh, from an online was VJ Srau, a former LSE student, saying, "Were we really doing well before the financial crisis, that's or was it all question. smoke and mirrors?" Okay, that's a great question. All right. Um, uh, so, the, just specifically on the question over here, on, I mean, clearly you're right, sir. Like, the, I don't think anybody could defend the sick pay system. That we have today in fact the government announced it was going to change the sick pay for those that don't know there is no entitlement to sick pay for the lowest earners in this country it's not some there's zero entitlement to it if you've got a good job you probably have good occupational sick pay coverage if you work for resolution foundation i hasten to add you do but low earners it is a joke the um, uh, it's particularly mad that we went through a pandemic like that we actually secretly basically did create a sick pay system through the back door through the furlough scheme, but we didn't want to tell anyone that. And we kind of undenied about telling firms they could use it for that, but some did. But yeah, no, you're completely right. And it doesn't make sense in a pandemic, obviously, but it doesn't make any sense uh, today. I would hope that some of that, some firms have slightly changed their mind on wanting everybody coughing over each other when they're ill, but you know, that's wishful thinking. So I can't, I don't think anyone could justify the current situation. There's some other things I might, we might have learned. Like, I mean, it, you, this, the death rate differential is so staggering during the pandemic across parts of our country, poorer places. I was up with the chief executive Bradford in New York yesterday. I mean, you saw huge dispersions in death rates, and, you know, not like double, more than double death rates in poorer areas. So some of that, I think, has in the public health world is being taken seriously. In the end, though, you've got to solve the economics to get to the grips with that. A bit of sick pay isn't going to deal with those problems. On the was it all OK pre-financial crisis? No. So I'll, I'll, I'll highlight a number of things. The, um, you better do it quick. Uh, you better okay. do we'll it. just briefly look. Was it okay? You better do it quickly though, because I'm getting emails that we've overrun. We've got to over. We've okay. got to wrap up soon. Okay. Go on. Uh, the, well, look, I mean, you all know the answers. No. Okay. One, obviously, we were living with that high inequality long before uh, the financial crisis started. On a technical basis, what we have learned is that the financial sector in the UK was too large before the financial crisis. That's why it's been shrinking ever since. Leaving aside whether it was regulated effectively, which I think we've all concluded after huge hits to our incomes was not a good idea. But, the, um, but so we've clearly learned, uh, we've learned that. We've learned that we need a broader economic strategy, even if that is still within the services um, uh, space. And we've learned that, I think we should have learned that yes, we made big progress on the minimum wage, but lots of other things about our society weren't what we wanted. So if you look at the 2000s, like productivity gaps between places in the UK haven't really increased since the financial crisis, despite what people say, they're broadly flat. But output gaps between places did rise significantly in the 2000s. Uh, some of that was for good reasons. We like the success of what were we discussing the other day? So Milton Keynes, Swindon, and North Hampshire. Yeah. I don't know what's in North Hampshire. That's your neck of the woods, but some things in North Hampshire that's really productive. Okay, but some good things will go on. But lots of that, but we didn't see much progress in lots of other areas. Everyone again says Manchester's a triumph these days. Manchester's got below average productivity growth in the 2000s and in the 2010s. So I think with lots of things we weren't happy with. Could I? I'll give you a story from the last thing to wrap up with. Things not being okay. I, I never forget being on a train back into London. I think from Stansted in. 2007 before the financial crisis before we were paying for banks okay uh got on the train first stop a guy gets on sits opposite me he's got a sandwich he's just bought he sits down his phone goes as he sits down okay i can only hear his half of the conversation we're going into london it's about 8 a.m in the morning and the guy on the other end of the phone is saying to him i don't actually need you for your shift sorry and he's saying i paid for my ticket i bought lunch i paid for childcare today and you're telling me i've got no work at all and the guy said, was basically saying, yes, that is what I'm telling you. That is compl was completely legal in pre-financial crisis Britain. That's completely legal in Britain in the 2022s. That is not what a decent society uh, looks like. So you don't need, I sometimes worry, you know, some of the conversations here about how do we, you know, there's some things that are hard, okay? Lots of countries have got big productivity slowdowns going on. Exactly how you get to a certain Gini coefficient on your, your measure, those things are, you know, hard and, and aren't all under our control, given the point that's been made earlier about the nature of the global economy. Some things are on our, under our control. 
and a bit more just making progress year on year in sorting out some of these big problems because we've decided that we're not prepared for low earners to have to live with that kind of indignity. I mean, I couldn't live with that. I couldn't pay a mortgage if I didn't know I was going to get paid any given day. I know I'm going to get paid every month, even whatever hours I work, more or less. The, um, that is not what a modern society looks like. So what we should learn is that that wasn't okay before the financial crisis. It's not okay now. It's time we actually did something about it. Excellent. Uh, good point to add on. So uh, thank you uh, very much, all of you, for coming. Uh, I should say um, there is plenty more opportunity to, yeah. for, for people to engage with the work of the inquiry. We're launching the interim report on the 13th of July. I think if you go to a Resi Foundation I'm not sure it's up yet, but QE2 Centre, Westminster, 13th of July, all day, come along. There will be coffee, which yeah. there might even be biscuits, other glamours are available. Uh, and I think that there will be something stronger than biscuits and tea for those of us who are uh, old enough or that way inclined uh, afterwards. So, um, Please do uh, hang about. Thank you to those of you who submitted questions online and thanks to those of you who uh, ask questions here in the audience. I hope you'll join me in uh, thanking our panelists for a fascinating discussion. Thank you.